Uh, it really is wonderful to be here. And uh, I think you know why I'm here, and I think I know why you're here, that we support Bishop Strickland, yeah. right? And I, we, we, love our, we love our Jesus, and we love our church, right? And we want to love all our bishops, all right? But a lot of them don't make that easy to do. But Bishop Strickland makes it easy uh, to love him and, and pray for him. And we appreciate so much the exceptional leadership that he is providing in the church. I know you've all made all sorts of sacrifices to be here this weekend, and I think he, he knows how much we, we love him and pray for him and admire him. I just want to make a disclaimer at the beginning of this talk, which is that uh, the bishop has no idea what I'm going to talk about. He doesn't, he didn't, we haven't talked about it, he hasn't seen a text, he hasn't approved it, so he shouldn't get in trouble for anything I say. He can get in enough trouble for the things that he says, right? So, right, so let's not attribute to him anything um, that, that I said. I, I traveled down with a, a very good friend, a longtime friend. Um, I think in the future, in the past, uh, she's been more um, combative, I think it might be the right word, than, than I have about various things. But she was saying, I don't think you should, pe people should say this or say that or say that. I said, that's my first 10 minutes of my talk, okay? <laughs> So I, I just warn you, um, I, and I, it, just a couple things. I mean, I, I am not in the least bit and never have been a cynical person. I actually am quite the Pollyanna um, in my heart and soul. I've always, I grew up with parents that had a really beautiful, optimistic, generous, grateful view of life. And we trusted, we trusted anybody in authority we, and I grew up in a small town in Pennsylvania. We never locked our doors. We didn't know what locks were for. You know, I, at seven years of age, I could basically go all over the town unsupervised with no concern about what might happen to me. So I've always had this really kind of, you know, really trusting view of, of authority, and especially the authority in the church. And it's been very hard, very hard for me to realize the amount of corruption in our church as well as the corruption in our culture. I mean, I thought the FBI, I mean, man, I thought, boy, if there's any men on the face of the earth you can trust to stand up for the good and the true, and they would be the, and justice, they would be the men, right? And everything's turned upside down, and I don't know if, if just I haven't seen it before, it's always been there, or it's, um, it's, it's so bad now that even someone as naive as myself um, can see it. See it. I mean, if I were to write an autobiography, one of the possible titles I've played with is um, a, life hood of, a Lifetime of Being Criminally Naive, <laughs> which is what I think I've been. Um, so it's, it's, it's hard for us. I'm, I remember the one story I've always loved is a story that's in Brideshead Revisited, where um, there's a man named Rex who's converting to Catholicism because he's marrying a very wealthy and, and sophisticated uh, English woman who's Catholic, and he wants a big Catholic women, uh, wedding with lots of cardinals and everything else. So he's going for instruction, and the priest that's instructing him is just tearing his hair out because Rex just doesn't have any, seem any knowledge of the supernatural. And the priest asks him, "Okay, Rex, let me ask you about infallibility." He said, "Suppose, I mean, you know what it means that." when we say the Pope is infallible. So how would you deal with the situation where um, the Pope said it was gonna rain tomorrow and then it didn't? He said, how, how would you explain that? And Rex sat, sat there and thought about it and he said, well, I would say it must be spiritually raining, but we're too corrupt to see it, okay? <laughs> now, now what's, it's a marvelous statement, I mean, a lot of Catholic explanations to things sound just like that, right? Yeah, well, that makes sense. Um, it's an answer, at least, anyway. But I, I think, I, I think I've, I haven't been too corrupt to see it. I think I've been too naive to see it. And as I started looking into the question of how did the church get where it is today, I've just been um, stunned uh, by how far back it goes and um, how embedded it is uh, in the church. And I want to say, that honestly, it hasn't done a bit um, to shake my faith. Uh, 
as, I mean, as, as I think Augustine and others said, if the church can survive this, it's got to be of God, right? If, if the church can survive the, the corrupt human element in it, then she, clearly the Holy Spirit is in this church. Uh, right now the Holy Spirit's hiding a bit, I think. Um, we're not, we're maybe too corrupt to see where the Holy Spirit uh, is right now. But it hasn't made me, um, it hasn't shaken my, my faith at all. It just makes me want to be not so naive, you might say, and, and try to be just a little more attuned to things and, and not want things to just be nice and rosy uh, all the time. So I'm just going to uh, go through a number of questions. My questions are, against where are we right now in the church? What is the crisis that we're in? Um, how did we get here? And then what do we do about it? Right? Uh, the first two have about 20 slides each. The last one is one slide, so which means I don't know. OK, um, I find this first slide profoundly profoundly disturbing, right? That's McCarrick and James Green, the man that, the young man that, one of the first young men that he um, raped, and he was his, I think his, his baptismal sponsor or his confirmation sponsor, and I think all of you know that picture. It haunts me, all right? It's, it, when I see it, I just, again, I just wanna lie on the floor and just say, why, Lord, why? Um, and I've worked with quite a few sex abuse victims over the last five years, and their stories are horrendous. And the way that they're, tr they're treated by the church is horrendous. I've actually worked with three bishops who have done a beautiful job, who have gone above and beyond what you can really expect any very busy man to do. But I've worked with others who lie like crazy, um, avoid any meetings, avoid any conversations, and the worst thing is they do lie. All right, so with McCarrick, people knew, as we, we say, some people say everybody knew, I didn't know, but a lot of people knew um, that he was taking young men to his um, summer cottage at where there were only um, four beds, and he would insist that four plus his own, that five young men be sent from seminary to come and stay with him, and one of them had to stay in the same bed with him. And he was doing this for years, and the Vatican did a very thick investigation of it. There's some interesting things in there, they learned some things, but as you turn page after page, you didn't ask this, you didn't ask this of those people, you should have asked this, that, or the other thing. And it's just, it's a surface kind of investigation. You know, they pat themselves on the back and say no, it, and unfortunately he was just declared incompetent to stand trial either yesterday or the day before. Um, the church was waiting for that. And by the church, of course, what do I mean? I mean, in that instance, I mean the evil element in the church, which I suppose I should never refer to as the church because the church is the bride of Christ, right? So there's an evil element in the church that never wanted people to know what he knew. Now this was another thing that knocked me over, which was the, course, the presence of Pat, Pachamama uh, in Rome and in, the, in uh, St. Peter's in Rome. And you're saying, what the heck is that all about? Why is there a pagan idol in the heart of, of Christendom? Right? You're thinking something is happening here that I never would have, never would have dreamed of. Now I'm not gonna give too many of these because I think you know these. Uh, we probably all have our own list of the things that really tore our hearts out as far as what was happening uh, to our church. But this was certainly one that uh, tore mine out. Uh, headline here, John Paul II Institute no longer reflects the aims of its namesake, critics contend. John, um, Pope Francis basically uh, forbade uh, the professors at uh, the John Paul II Institute to teach the thought of John Paul II. It was no longer considered to be um, what the church teaches about these things. And now they were gonna use social sciences and more modern studies, et cetera, rather than uh, John Paul II's thought. Uh, as some of you know, I mean, John Paul II was one of the most brilliant um, philosopher theologians that the church has ever had. One of the most brilliant pope theologians 
philosophers that has ever lived. And he left us a legacy of thought that is staggering <laughs> for how profound and beautiful it is. And he set up, I think at one point there were nine different John Paul II institutes around the world. He wanted one on <clears throat> every uh, continent so students uh, could get to it. And now the one that is in the heart of Rome no longer finds it worthy to teach his thought. Right? Uh, it's criminal. Uh, this one is just meant to re represent uh, the financial uh, scandals that are deep in the church. A lot of people don't know about those. Uh, a lot of us know about the liturgical scandals and the um, sex abuse scandals, but how much money laundering there is in the church is something that we have not yet really faced, all right? And it's coming, it's coming. It's being uncovered and we'll learn more about it soon. But many of you will follow this story where the Vatican purchased a very expensive or building for a lot of money in London, not at all clear what the purpose of that building is, paid way more for it than it could possibly uh, be worth. And now there's a, huge, um, there's a huge trial going on in the Vatican itself, trying to figure out who approved this, who did this, why was it done? And the question is, where did the money go? What is the money being used for? And this is one of the uh, documents that has shaken me a great deal. The apostolic letter issued uh, a motu proprio, um, traditionis custodis, the, the document that is um, directed towards greatly limiting the availability of the traditional Latin mass. Um, I've spent a lot of the last four or five years digging deep into the traditional Latin mass. I grew up with it. Um, liked it just fine, but it was virtually nothing of what you compared to what you have today. I mean, the, the mass in my parish church in a small town in Pennsylvania, Sunday mass was like 19 minutes, right? How do you get through a Latin mass, in 19, any mass in 19 minutes? But the, the priest didn't know Latin, didn't like Latin. They ran through the text. Um, the reverence that there is now, the glory that there is now, um, was not present in a lot of places, right? Um, and then I didn't, I had opportunities, I suppose, to attend some Latin masses, though of course that they were forbidden for a very long time, hard to find. Had to go to a schoolroom or a gym or a basement somewhere uh, to find someone who would say them. But I, I didn't gravitate to that because uh, one thing, for a long time I was teaching at Notre Dame and um, I had enough going to make me unpopular at Notre Dame, I didn't want to add one more thing to the heap, though I think it would have helped me as it has. It would have helped me tremendously spiritually. As a matter of fact, my friend that brought me here today, we, she always went to the traditional Latin Mass, and we'd go for long walks in the neighborhood in Irving, Texas, when I was teaching at the University of Dallas, and I was always defending the, the Novus Ordo, and she just would look at me like, you don't know what you're talking about, which was pretty much true, as I've, <laughs> I've now discovered. Um, that's a tremendously disappointing and um, demoralizing document. As, as those of us who do attend the traditional Latin Mass, they're bursting at the seams um, with young Catholics. Uh, it's just beautiful. Uh, large families, lots of noise. It's beautiful. These kids, uh, they sit there, a lot of them sit there very nicely for an hour and a half. It's amazing to me. Um, the altar boys blow me away. Uh, we have 18 at our church, and they are, they're more disciplined, I hope they don't hear me, they're more disciplined than our pastors are about um, how, how the rubrics are, are done, etc., cetera, um, during mass. So that's a, just a slight run through. I mean, I could, I could talk probably for hours about the shocking things in the church today that unsettle us, but I, I don't think there's a need for that. I mean, I'm sure each one of you, I, I could just ask you, you know, what, what has disturbed you and you would come up with some, some very interesting things. But this is what we, what we had at one time. Right? It's just unbelievably um, beautiful. Uh, and then we came to this, right? what they call a clown mass. Now, of all the bad Novus Ordo masses I've been to, I've never been to a clown mass, thank God. Um, but you say, like, what? What is that? I mean, that's not every Sunday, and it's not every place, all right? 
but most of us have been to a, a Novus Ordo litur liturgy at some point that we felt like walking out of um, because it was so um, irreverent, confusing, um, just didn't, didn't rise to the occasion, which is um, making the sacrifice, a uh, Thanksgiving sacrifice uh, for our Lord. So the big question is, what am I looking at? And how did we get here, right? How did it happen that we went from beautiful, beautiful cathedrals and beautiful masses and sound doctrine and uh, monasteries and convents full and Catholic schools at virtually every parish um, full to the, the seams with, with uh, children? How did we go from that to where we are today? There's lots of explanations. I'm sure I'm not going to hit everything that um, is pertinent. And then we have this. I don't see no miracle on how we got here. Here was where we was headed, right? Um, then I keep going back a bit further. You know, I, I, go, I go back to this date in the 60s and then before Vatican II and things that happened. And you go back in mid-19th century and maybe even earlier. Um, some seeds. I mean, I, obviously I could do... Um, I could do the expulsion of Adam and Eve from the garden. That's where it started, okay? Um, but as far as the, the things you can more or less directly uh, attribute where we are today. So there's different kinds of corruptions I'm going to talk about. Uh, doctrinal corruption, financial corruption, political corruption, liturgical corruption, and sexual corruption. I'm going to spend just a, a little bit of time, in a sense, on, on each one. And the topics I'm going to take up are, are these. Um, modernism and the roots of modernism in modern philosophy, uh, in masonry, uh, in uh, the topic of the communist relationship to the church, uh, the Vatican Bank, uh, some remarks on China as exemplary of some things, Vatican II, uh, the liturgy, and sex abuse. I want to say most of the time when you hear someone give a talk, they're just giving you a small fraction of what they know, you know, maybe 5%, 10%. I want you to know this is everything I know. If you push me, I'm going to collapse, all right? So um, don't think I'm hiding much from you. What you see is what I've got to give you, all right? So if you ask me questions, the answer is going to be no comment, all right? We'll see. Anyway. All right, what do, I, what do I mean by doctrinal corruption? Uh, Bishop Strickland frequently uses the beautiful phrase, the deposit of faith, and that his job as a bishop is to protect and promote the deposit of faith. And what is the deposit of faith? I mean, that, that it, it's a funny term, of course, because it seems like a bank term, that there's some bank vault somewhere that has the faith stored there. Um, that's not, is that me? That's you. Somebody else. Okay. It, sometimes it's my phone, you know, that's very embarrassing. I turned it off. Um, anyway, uh, where was I? Deposit of the faith. I mean, we, we go to the bank and we make a deposit, and we know that that's going to be safe and protected, and it's going to be there for when we, need, when we need it, and we have to use it for something. And we want it to grow and build, but we certainly want it protected. If we open that door and there's nothing there, we're devastated. It's something that we put together up a lot of hard work and depend upon. Well, the church has had centuries of um, praying about, thinking about, talking about, arguing about various doctrines from the very beginning, from the very beginning. And things have worked out, uh, or are worked out, let's say, through councils and study and academic conferences. And we start to gather something. We say, this is reliable Catholic teaching. You want to know something what the church teaches? I mean, the catechism is just one of the best places to go. This is it. We could call that the deposit of the faith. This is what we as Catholics believe. You don't want to go chipping away at that, just like you don't want, you know, a mice to get into your bank and chew up all your little bills and whatever's there, right? This is something that's of in, in much more value than anything monetary uh, could be, the truth. There's nothing more valuable. Um, than the truth. And the church has a lot of truth. We know it's just a tip of an iceberg. I mean, we, the, the amount of truth there really is that for us to know is infinitely bigger than what we do know. But we won't learn any of that unless we are true to what we've already learned. 
So what happened? One thing that happened, honestly, was modern philosophy. After the Middle Ages, where Thomas Aquinas, and then for some centuries after that, beautiful Bonaventure and others just uh, built us a huge edifice of truth, all right? And it was done, I mean, if you look at Thomas Aquinas, I mean, it, it, he, wrote, he wrote these, um, the Summa, and it has in it what are called questions. What about this? Is God a body? And then you get a number of statements that say, um, well, yes, he is a body. And you, get, you find very brilliant philosophers, etc., say God's a body. And then you get a, a said contra against that, no, God is not a body. And then you get a statement that explains why God is not a body. And then you have the replies to the original, what are called objections. It's a conversation. It's not as if it's something, it's not like the Ten Commandments that came on down high and thank God they did, written on stone by the finger of God. But what Thomas does is he says, well, there's a really brilliant, brilliant Arabic philosopher over there who says this. It challenges our faith. I'm not just going to just dismiss him and say we don't talk to them, we don't listen to them. No, Thomas says, I'm going to hear everything. He says, in fact, I'll make his argument for him better than he can make it for himself. So Thomas would do. And then I'm going to show why it's false, and I'm going to tell you what the truth is. And so it's this very dialogical, dynamic process, but not one that, today we tend to think that dialogue is always going to end in uncertainty and in a question, right? That if we talk together, what we'll realize is we both got a little bit of the truth and a little bit of falsehood, and we just live with that. Whereas Thomas said, no, 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 no. I, I mean, he's not going to say this is an absolute truth, but sometimes there are absolute, there are absolute, two and two equals four. It just does, all right? God is the Trinity. God is love. Anything you say that's against that is false, right? Now, that doesn't mean we understand those truths completely. Again, they have an infinite amount of um, material that uh, is behind those in implications of those truths, um, et cetera. Well, there, was a, there came a time when philosophers said, no, 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 this stuff about revelation that God speaks to man and God became man, I mean, that's all myth, all right? No, no rational person would believe those things. I mean, if you're a really rational person, you only believe basically what your senses and your mind tell you. If you believe something that an angel told you or that Jesus performed miracles, I mean, and as you know, some of the most ridiculous theology that's been done in the modern time is trying to explain Jesus' miracles as somehow, you know, when, the, when he, we all know the one where he distributed the, the bread and fishes, that it was really just getting the Jews to share their lunches, which were up their sleeves somehow. And of course, it's a miracle to get Jews to share their lunches. I mean, it's the most, most insulting kind of um, explanation of, of what went on. So, but they didn't want to listen to philosophy anymore. They didn't want to start anything that started with, you know, God created the world. And now what do we know about the world? Because we know this is God's world and God is a good God and a loving God and a just God and a beautiful God. And so what can we, since we know that, what does that help us understand about the world? Modern philosophers said, no, it's, that, I'm not starting there at all. I'm starting there with what I can know. And Descartes the famous one. What did Descartes know? Descartes knew that he doubted his existence. That's the truth, that's the first truth he could figure out. I'm sure if I asked you right now, just shut your eyes and think about what, a, what is the most true thing I know? The most true thing I know. It might be hard to find, but I mean, there's lots of true, really truth guys. Sky's blue, the grass is green, you know, my mother loves me. There's, there's a bunch of things that are really true when you know these things. But Descartes worked it all up and he came and said, well, the one thing I'm sure about is that I'm not sure about things. That's the one thing I'm sure about. And then you can say, well, I'm not sure about that either, of course. I, mean, I had a wonderful experience when I was an undergraduate that has completely marked my life. I had a professor who, we were all, this was in the 60s, and we were all relativists, subjectivists, and we didn't think there was such a thing as truth. Um, and that we didn't even know whether the external world existed uh, as, a, as a place where modern philosophy landed at a certain point. And this one professor, he was teaching um, Greek tragedy. He was teaching the Medea. And the Medea is a story about a woman husband, who has a husband, Jason, who has been unfaithful to her. And he's coming back from war. And she is mad, all right? So what Medea does is she cuts up their two children, cuts them in little pieces, puts them in the boiling water, and feeds them to Jason. 
Now, a lot of you are just saying, yeah. <laughs> so the professor, he was, of course, hoping that would our response. Because in, in, the, in the play, there's all this impending doom, like Jason's going to get it, because Jason deserves it. And the gods, the gods approve of Jason getting it, not what Medea does, of course. And we know that when Medea does that, then there's even more evil in the world, and it's just sort of perpetuating the evil instead of having justice. And so he says, well, did, you know, why is there this sense of impending doom? Did, does Jason deserve some kind of punishment for what he did? And we're all there saying, oh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It's a different time, different. Who knows what's right and wrong? So this one student says, I don't know. He says, who can say what's right and wrong? And he says, you, you, well, he said, oh, well, Medea, I mean, did Medea cut up the children and, and boiled them and fed them to Jason? Is, is that, did she do wrong? Oh, I, I couldn't say. I don't know. All right? I don't know what's right and wrong. The professor would say, okay, let me start somewhere else. He'd say, are there or are there not pink, 40 pink elephants in this room? Yeah. And the student said, no, I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm sitting there saying, <laughs> there's not one gray elephant in this room. There's no elephants in this room. I'm thinking, I don't know what to do. I can't believe this kid is saying this. I don't know whether there's any pink elephants in the room. The professor said, well, do you exist or not? Tell me. Do you know that? Do you know whether or not you exist? He says, no, I don't know whether or not I exist. I don't know anything for certain. He said, do you know that for certain? He said, no, I don't know anything. For, I don't even know that for certain. So the professor stand there, and after a while he said, well, I think I'm going to have to terminate this discussion. He said, because I'm going to start questioning my own sanity if I'm talking to a person who doesn't know whether or not he exists. Right? This went on for, for days and days. Same conversation in the class, same conversation over and over again. But that's the modern world. We don't know. We just can't say. Is someone born a boy biologically, could he really be a girl? Well, he thinks so, or somebody thinks so, so it must be you know, I think, who am I to say? Who am I to say? It's your opinion versus my opinion. Now, I'll respect your lunas, lunatical, lun, what do you say, lunacy. I'll respect your lunacy if you respect mine. Right? It's just, uh, and that's where we are today. And the modern world said, there's, there, you can't, you, well, somebody could say, look at the Bible. The Bible says this. It says adultery is always wrong. So can you know that? Well, who wrote the Bible? Who says that? Well, Aristotle and Aquinas both said, you know it without the Bible but you certainly know it with the Bible, right? So well, the modern world just said, if you, can't prove it in the, if you can't prove it in laboratory, it's not true, right? And even there, it's not true. You know, all you know is that this experiment worked, but you don't really know that that's about the world. You, you know, nobody knows that. Nobody can actually know that there is an exterior world, let alone that we can know it. Everything is matter, there's nothing spiritual, there's not a soul. And then you turn to subjectivity and relativism. I live in my world, you live in your world. I should be allowed to do whatever I want. You should be allowed to do whatever you want. When we conflict, what, who's, who's gonna win? Well, whoever has the most power, honestly. It has become a situation where might is right, right? Whoever can put people on the court to distort the law however they want to distort it is the person who now decides um, the truth. So modern philosophy has been a lot behind what happened in the church. It infiltrated into the church. Um, infiltration isn't a, the book by Taylor Marshall isn't about that so much, but there, there has been an infiltration of the modern philosophy into the church, and thinking that um, you know the this, the way that the Catechism and John Paul II and others thought, that's really a medieval way of thinking and an ancient way of thinking. It's not a modern way of thinking. So we have to, to tailor the, the church um, to fit to the modern view. Now, a lot of people don't uh, like Taylor Marshall or this book, though a lot of people do like Taylor Marshall and this book, by the way. Um, I've read almost every book that I've, I've, I've listed here. I, I would have done some editing on that one, but I'm pretty sure the fundamental thesis is sound, that there has been some really serious infiltration of the church by ideas that are absolutely alien um, to the Catholic understanding of the world. Now, I, again, I could give a whole talk, well, I couldn't, but someone who knew a lot about Freemasonry could give a whole talk about Freemasonry, but it has been condemned by the church for a very long time. And you know, being Americans, we don't like something called a conspiracy theory. That word, it's saying that there's a conspiracy 
or, or marks you as being some sort of lunatic, right? You just don't trust anything. Well, seriously, if we trust anything right now, we're, we're lunatics. That's all I have to say. Um, you know, that what we're told by our government, what we're told by the medical profession, what we're told by a lot of people in the church, we have no idea what they're saying is true or not, right? We just can't trust people anymore. And so, um, but, but when people would say, oh, the Freemasons uh, t are taking over the church, people would say, oh, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I, I, don't, I, my, my, I don't do that. I think that's, that's silly. People are just silly conspiracy theorists. But the church has, has been understood what Freemasonry is for centuries, has warned against it, taught against it. This is not something that just a few, you know, uh, I'm going to use the word lunatic over and over again, but the lunatics of the modern age have, have um, made up. It was written originally just that they were all these guilds of stonemasons. And then at a certain point around the mid late 18th century, it became a quasi-religious organization very much against the Catholic Church. And at the highest levels is satanic. And at the highest level, there may be um, satanic sexual, ritual sexual abuse, right? It's very hard to find those things out, but it's not unlikely that that is the case. And this is a description. When a mason reaches the 30th degree in the Masonic hierarchy, called the Kadash, the person crushes with his foot the papal tiara and the royal crown and swears to free mankind from the bondage of depotism and the thraldom of spiritual tyranny. Now, we think of the masons largely as those guys that you know, drive their go-karts around at the 4th of July parade and toss out um, Tootsie Rolls uh, to kids. That's what I knew them as when I was a kid. Uh, Shriners, I think, was uh, one version. It was a good, pretty good organization. It did a lot of good work for the community. But a lot of the people who joined it didn't know what was going on at the much, much most of them who joined it did not know what was going on at the higher levels. So from 1738 to 1983, Catholics were forbidden to join the Masons under the pain of excommunication excommunication to belong to the Masons. In fact, it's, 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 uh, there's no longer excommunication attached to belonging to the Masons, but um, it, is, it is taught to be a mortal sin because it's an organization that by its very um, stated mission is to destroy the Catholic Church. And obviously it would be a mortal sin for a Catholic to belong to an organization that has as its mission destroying the Catholic Church. Again, if you don't know things, you're not culpable for them, etc. So we have to always make those distinctions. But it's not an innocent thing, right? Another story a lot of you know about is, is Bella Dodd. Um, uh, there's a new book about her, The Devil and Bella Dodd. She was a, um, an American, uh, well, an Italian actually, who came here with a large Catholic family. They lost their faith. That book called The School of Darkness is, is her um, autobiography. And uh, she was a communist for many decades um, and did a lot of work with the teachers unions in New York City and at one point had a conversion uh, and did a lot of talking with uh, Archbishop Fulton Sheen about the Catholic faith. He basically brought her into the church and she has made a claim and the claim has been of many different natures that she brought 1,100 or 1,200 communists into the Catholic priesthood. Right? That's a claim that she's made, that the Catholic priesthood has been infiltrated by communists and that she was there and she did it, but that um, Sheen told her she should not name names. And she said she knew four cardinals who were Masons, who were in Rome, and he told her not to name names. I've, I've always been a little bit skeptical uh, about this. Uh, anybody who's tried to get vocations, knowing getting, you know, in a period of a, a 15, yeah, 1100. And we've had virtually, um, maybe one, but uh, maybe two at the most, individuals who say that they were a part of that, all right? And we're not sure we can trust them. And so I, I just say, how can you get 1100 men into the priesthood, number one, who don't believe, all right? who are gonna go to, through seminary not believing and go through all the rigmarole it takes to become a priest and not believe, and then at some point, somebody's gonna convert and believe 
and is going to spill the beans. That hasn't happened. Um, but that there was an infiltration of ideas, I think is true. I think that's true. Uh, there's this one book that's uh, quite the read, AA 1025. This was a, 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 a woman who became a nun who was a nurse, and she was attending to a patient, and he died, and she found among his stuff this manuscript, this book, that AA 1025 means he's an agent, number 1025, who has, and that, I mean, the number 1100, I don't know. Uh, Anyway, that was his number for the number of communists that he says were bought into the church, right? And he tells about how he came into the church and how he became a professor and was teaching communist ideas in his, his classes, right? Uh, whether that, that, no one's ever verified that book. Um, and as Alice von Hildebrand said, if, if the nun made it up, she had the most incredible prophetic powers that anybody could have about what did happen in the seminaries. And then we have this one. There's a Vatican official um, now who's a chaplain of three Masonic lodges, right? We have a, a Vatican official who now is in charge of Masonic lodges, and that's it's the that that's a, it's a, you know it's like a boy becomes a girl, a priest becomes a Mason. You want to say it can't be, right? It, not, it just can't be. They're they're totally incompatible. So for a very long time, as I said, the Church has spoken against. Um, the Masons. One is Pope Pius X, and he um, put together what's called a syllabus of errors of modernism, that calls modernism, um, lamentabili sane exitu, and it means um, clearly worthy of tears without end, right? <laughs> That's a beautiful title, manifestly worthy of tears without end, and then he names 65 errors that are true of modernism that have infiltrated into the church, right? This was in the, um, I think it's um, 1907, right? And these errors are still in the church. And so obviously there was something going on in the Catholic seminaries, the Catholic universities, where modern philosophical teaching had seeped into the seminaries to the point where every clergy, pastors, confessors, preachers, religious superiors, and professors in seminaries had to take the oath against modernism. It was something that everyone had to do. And then that was dropped in 1967. Why? Right? Why was that dropped? Then eventually there was put together an oath of fidelity, which I had to take when I taught in the seminary and most everybody else did too in most, most seminaries. But people find that constrains their freedom to have to take an oath, right? That this is what I believe and what I, I teach. And you say, well, if we're Catholics, there are certain things we must believe as Catholics. And if you're teaching in a seminary, you must teach what the Catholic Church teaches, right? So again, modernism is basically an, an adaptation of the church to the modern world. The syllabus of errors listed 65 widespread modern errors. There was, they call it, I should have quotes around the phrase, the synthesis of all errors have all come into sort of one, it's one big bucket. There's a whole bunch of different um, isms that are a part of modernism. Basically, it's a radical denial of the faith, right? Um, some are agnostic, they don't know whether God exists, some are radical evolutionists, um, we've heard this today, uh, doctrine evolves, everything evolves. Just because it was this way then doesn't mean it will be this way now. Homosexuality was once considered always wrong, now it's considered to be you're allowed to love whoever you want to love. And some people say the church's teaching has just evolved. It can't, right? That's our deposit of faith, all right? Subjectivism, relativism, and communism. Now, uh, one of my, my very first teaching job was at the University of Notre Dame in the 1980s. And believe me, it was filled with modernists, right? It was filled with modernists, as it is today, right? Less so maybe than before, right? So there have been more faithful Catholics are getting jobs at the most incredible places. Um, and um, even at that time, there was a talk of schism, that there was a talk that at a certain point, because, you know, John Paul II was the Holy Father. 
and nobody could handle that. And such a tyrant, right? Such a such an unbending, rigid man who wouldn't bow to the um, brilliance of modern theologians. Right? So there's a talk that there was going to be a schism in the United Church and that the universities, which were almost 100% um, dissenters from church teaching, uh, would lead the way, would lead the way. Uh, it didn't happen, but if you go back and look at the major journals at the time, there was a lot of talk of that. Then. And I feel a little bit like deja vu right now. Like I, some of this seems familiar. I've been here before. Um, these are four of the major two dissenters at the time of the 80s, certainly Charles Curran, who was my big bugaboo because he was the one that was really uh, defending or, or uh, criticizing uh, the church's teaching on contraception. He was the chief opponent of Humanae Vitae and Hans Kung. I actually led a demonstration against Han Kung at the University of Notre Dame when I was only there for one year. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you clap, but my, my parents weren't. They didn't quite understand. Um, okay, the third one there is um, Palia, who is a, a very corrupt uh, cardinal, very high in Rome. He was just named a cardinal. He, it, his... Um, Parish, some of you, somebody will know where that is, but he had a mural painted behind the altar, behind the altar, a mural painted with um, pictures of homosexuals uh, um, groping each other. And he put a picture of himself in that um, mural in our church. When I first found out about this, I was living with another Catholic woman and I, I said, I think we should get on the next plane and go over there and buy buckets of acid and throw it on the um, on the murals, and she did. She was not for it. Um, of course, I wasn't either. But I thought, I thought, but that is the kind of response that is, is as a matter of fact, is um, measured uh, to the evil that is in front of us. We shouldn't allow it. We should not allow it. whatever we have to do. I mean, you don't want to get violent, but you can destroy things. You can destroy vicious things. Um, after all, you're going through the proper channels, etc. Anyway, and then we have, of course, uh, Father James Martin, um, who is just crafty as can be, but anybody who has eyes to see know exactly what he's doing. He's greatly promoting um, same-sex unions as being perfectly moral in the church. So the dissenters really that we fought in the 70s and 80s and honestly thought we had somewhat successfully silenced are all back, all right, with a vengeance, all right, with a vengeance, even more so. Their, their views are more radical now than their views were in the, um, the 80s. We thought that John Paul II, with all of his encyclicals and all of the appointments he made and all sorts of things that he had put an end um, to it, we turned a corner. And I was stunned um, when I saw what was happening in um, mostly the second decade of this uh, century. Oh, I went backwards. How silly. Uh, backwardism right in front of you. Okay, isn't it? This is what the Holy Father says. People like me are backwards people. We keep wanting to go back. All right, no, I'm, I'm going to forge on here. All right, we're going to talk about financial corruption. Not much, because I don't know much about it, but I have some friends who are really digging deep into the question of financial corruption into the church. Uh, I found this slide on the, on the internet. <laughs> I, keep think, I keep thinking, what does it mean? But I mean, it's, God came to give us life, not cash. I mean, ca the, between you know, Adam and God, this is the spark of life that comes in love and life and truth and all those things. Instead, it's cash, it's all about money, all right? This book just blew my mind. Um, God's Bankers, A History of Money and Power at the Vatican. It is astonishing. Uh, and it, it starts really in the, in the early parts of the last century where the, ch the church was absolutely penniless. Uh, the Pope was living at the St. John Lateran Church and there were rats running around his, his, um, his accommodations. And some really brilliant person came and said, you know, the, the church need, could run a bank. And it's run a bank since that time. 
and that bank has largely been used for money laundering, right? But the way that that bank has been set up is in itself criminal. There is absolutely no accountability to any regulatory um, bodies, right? The Vatican Bank destroys all of its records every 10 years. So nobody knows what's going on. Nobody knows what comes in from whom and goes out for what. And it's a beautiful uh, money laundering possibility. It's like you're giving charity to the church. And then the church finds a way to um, funnel it back to um, really evil people doing evil things, right? Um, it's quite, quite the story. Uh, it will blow your mind, as will this next one called Operation Gladio. It's very complicated, and I've read these things, and they sort of go, I probably have to read them about 10 times to really grasp everything, because it's not uh, matters that my mind is used to thinking about. But um, this is the unholy alliance between the Vatican, the CIA, and the Mafia. And this also has a lot to do with the Vatican Bank, that um, the popes were more afraid of communism than they were of fascists, and they were willing to fund fascists in order to stop communism. And Operation Gladio had all sorts of cells of fascists around Italy that the church was gonna be ready to galvanize if there should be some communist takeover of, of Italy. They needed to fund it. And so they funded it through uh, many organizations, but in the United States, the CIA and the mafia. CIA is like, the, it's answerable to nobody. It's answerable to nobody. The president doesn't know what the CIA uh, is doing. And one of the things that they did that's unbelievably reprehensible was to get money uh, to finance all these projects. So they started selling drugs, right? The mafia started selling drugs. And they started selling them in ghetto communities in the United States to people that they thought were quite worthless, right? And they got them on drugs and got a huge flow of money. And that would go through the Vatican and then go to other places, right? It's... It <laughs> I mean, maybe it's wrong. I mean, maybe it's somebody's got an incredible imagination, but you know, he's got footnotes to, to newspaper stories and, and um, court cases and meetings, et cetera. It's worth looking at. Then this is one that's coming up soon for everybody's attention. Um, probably some of you, I don't know, you know kind of a group you are exactly, uh, but probably a lot of you don't like church militant. A lot of people love church militant, but they certainly cover some news that nobody else will. And this is one of them, that there's a, get this name, you can't make it up. It's Cardinal Pizza Bella, all right, that's his name. Good pizza, beautiful pizza, all right, Cardinal Pizza Bella. Um, he's a patriarch of Jerusalem, and he set up a huge, uh, with others, of course, a huge money laundering scheme where he uh, set up a, a university in Jordan and found an American uh, Jordanian, nationalized Jordanian, who had a very wealthy man who had made his money running hotels in the United States, and founded it under three different names, which is suspicious, kept getting him to get loans for amounts of money that was way more uh, than they needed for the projects that they were, were doing. And he realized at a certain point that he was being used, this Jordanian, Ben Sarani is his name, um, it was being used uh, as, a, as a money launderer, and he's blown the whistle. He kept meticulous records of this, and he is suing uh, to get his money back and wants to make it, it public. So watch for that. Political corruption. You know, the, the church at one point basically thought that, I mean, I mean there, was certainly, there was certainly some real union between excuse me, the church and the state. Um, but more and more over history, it became clear that there was a realm where it was supposed to be the church's realm, and then there's the realm of the state. And these aren't supposed to be wedded uh, together. Again, too much room for corruption. Well, uh, recently some amazing stories have come out about how much the Democratic Party gives money to the Catholic Church so the Catholic Church will take care of immigrants. I, I'm all for taking care of legal immigrants and certainly doing whatever is humane for illegal immigrants. But what they're doing, as we know, a lot of it is um, sexual trafficking of children, right? 
there's 85,000 missing children at least who have come across the border, right? And they come across largely for sexual um, purposes. And the Catholic Church is very much abating, aiding and abetting that, all right, through its organizations. And I know too little about the Vatican-China deal, but um, the current uh, Vatican has um, allowed the Chinese government to name the bishops and cardinals of uh, China, has uh, given the church over uh, to the state. And the, those of, I have friends who have been to China, to underground church in China, and they say it, it, it's really hard to believe how beautiful the Chinese people are and how very, very deep their faith is, right? And, the sacrifices that they make in order to retain their faith and how the gra grandmothers teach it to their grandchildren. And children know how to say their prayers and they, they, they believe, they truly, truly believe and they want to be able to be free members of a church but their church is now being controlled by the Chinese uh, government. Now liturgical corruption is maybe the, the issue I know the most about and it's another one that just completely um, threw me back on my heels. McCarrick was one of them. And then the, I uh, started seeing that the traditional Latin Mass was starting to be given in different places. I had I'd been for several years sort of in the boondocks with my mother who had dementia. I came back to the Ann Arbor area and I discovered that the Latin Mass was being offered in different places. I'm going to check this out. I was blown away. I mean, for me, it was just uh, my, my Catholic faith just completely exploded my love of the liturgy exploded, and I really wanted to go back and find out what the heck happened um, that we went from this beautiful liturgy to even when the Noah's order has, is done reverently, which it certainly can been, be, there are more reverent um, offerings of the uh, Novus Ordo Mass in the Ann Arbor than almost any other area I can possibly dream of. But as most of us know, we don't sort of just show up in a town and go to a mass, all right? You do some study beforehand because you don't know what you're going to get unless you try to figure out what's offered in that church. So people told me one thing I had to read was about how the Latin mass came to be. And there's this book by um, Yves Sharon called Annabale Bunini. Many of you know the story. If you don't, it's really worth getting to know. Um, Yves Sharon is a very careful scholar. Uh, and he, but he shows that Bonini, there was a whole movement of the liturgy all through the, um, the 20th century. There were, all, in France and Germany, there were all sorts of experimentation going on. Um, people trying to uh, change the, get rid of the Latin mass or change it in important ways. And Bonini was certainly in, um, among that group. But he was chosen by Paul VI uh, to set up a special commission supposedly to put into place the directives of Vatican II, um, Sacrosanctum Concilium, which calls for almost nothing that's in the Novus Ordo Mass. Right? If you read Sacrosanctum Concilium and you look at the Novus Ordo, they, uh, uh, you say, what? Again, what? Latin was never meant to disappear, as you know, it was meant to retain a, a privileged place. There was no change of taking away the communion rail, there was no turning the, the, the priest around to face the people. Um, Gregorian chant was meant to be a constant. Uh, so all those things went, not because of Vatican II, all right, but because of Bunini. Um, there was recently a, a five-part series of articles by three distinguished scholars in what's called the Notre Dame Church Life Journal and a five-part series crit criticizing the Latin Mass. It really got me going. You know, when I was an undergraduate, I had a professor, and he would ask students to come to talk to him about choosing a topic for a paper. And when I went in, I said, I'm having trouble finding a topic. And he says, well, I've seen how you operate. He says, does anything make you mad? He says, you do really good work when you're mad. <laughs> I'm mad a lot, so I do a lot of good work. So it made me mad that these five distinguished scholars wrote this critique. I, and of course, that I'm, not, I'm not opposed to the Latin Mass being critiqued. I think it's one of the best ways we arrive at truth is to do our best to um, criticize whatever it is that 
we don't like and then give other people an opportunity to respond. But what happened here is I think they completely misrepresented some very important church documents and showed an abysmal lack of knowledge of certain principles and the history of the Latin Mass and made accusations that were completely without warrant. So I wrote a five-part series against them and a whole set of other scholars wrote uh, pieces and it's now been put together in this book called Illusions of Reform. This is a good primer um, for what is the debate between the traditional Latin Mass and the Novus Ordo. And my parish, uh, St. Thomas the Apostle in Ann Arbor, we coexist very nicely, I have to say. We're, the, the, we get along, all right, we understand, and there's some crossover of attendance. Uh, um, so it doesn't have to be that people are totally at odds with each other, but understanding some of the issues can really help. Now Vatican II, oh, you wanna get in trouble? Right? Want to get in trouble? I mean, my, my grandmother said, she, I think I was somewhere around five or six, she said at the, the breakfast table one day, I just sat there and I looked up and said, Grandma, I'm going to be bad all day today. And I don't think I've ever really gotten over that. I mean, it's just like whatever somebody's stomping on, I, I want to get in there. I want to get in there, I, I don't, especially if it's my church, all right? I want, I want to get in there. I want to be a part of the fight. So, I, again, all up until about the last five, six years, I never really questioned Vatican II, right? I was one of those that always said, well, it's the spirit of Vatican II that's the problem. Vatican II is wonderful. I read all the documents. My friends and I had a study group when I was uh, um, in graduate school, and we all were defending Humanae Vitae. I wrote a defense of Dignitatum Humanus, um, the one on religious liberty. And, but when I, after I read about Brunini and the Novus Ordo, I said, wait a second, I need to take a closer look. I can't just, again, just like the, I didn't want to look at the Vatican, I didn't want to look at the Latin Mass in the 70s and 80s and 90s. I didn't want to, ex I didn't have any reason to think that Vatican II was a problem, you know? I, I thought, well, it's fine. And then people start saying, well, there's a problem with Vatican II. Say, so, well, whoa, well, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to just run from that. I'm going to take a look at it. Uh, one of my great mentors, Ralph McInerney, wrote this book, What Went Wrong with Vatican II? And he, he really didn't think much went wrong with Vatican II. He did think it was the spirit of Vatican II. Um, it certainly was a legitimate council. It was called legitimately. It's called it to be a pastoral council. It's, they claim that there's no new doctrines proclaimed there. Um, but we're more and more realizing that many parts of it were very ambiguous and maybe deliberately so, right? Maybe deliberately so. And of course, a lot of people take refuge that there's the letter of Vatican II and their spirit of Vatican II, but some of us aren't convinced by that. We think there's something in the letter of Vatican II that also was problematic. And one of them is the beautiful man we just heard from, Archb uh, our Bishop uh, Athanasius Schneider. He is one of the most erudite men and gentlemen that I can imagine. And this book, The Springtime That Never Came, is beautiful. And he's very fair-handed. He doesn't want to, there's no way he wants to dismiss Vatican II or trash Vatican II or get rid of Vatican II. But he says there are some problematic passages that we have to pay some attention to. We can't just say, ah, oh, it's a church council, everything's hunky-dory, right? There may be problems. And see, these are some of the, the worries. Uh, an overemphasis on ecumenism or a really misunderstanding of what genuine ecumenism is. Uh, it tends to put forward on a quality of religions. All religions are equal. Um, for instance, it, it seems to be telling us that we shouldn't work to convert the Jews, right? That God has them in a covenant that's their covenant, and we have our covenant, and we shouldn't be trying to bring the Jews into our covenant. And that the Muslims, in fact, worship the same God uh, as Christians do. There's the passages that suggest uh, a tendency towards universalism, the notion that everybody's saved. It doesn't matter whether you believe or don't believe or what you believe, we're all saved. Uh, there's, a mis there's some suggestion that religious liberty might be a problematic concept as set out, which puts a primacy of conscience over objective truth. Um, and there's, there's, surprisingly enough, there was no condemnation of communism. And part of the reason for that is said to be that there were certain 
bishops in the Eastern world or, or Russian world that wouldn't come uh, if there was going to be a condemnation of communism. So the church agreed not to put one in there. And then a certain sense, an openness to the world. We have to try to, in every way, adapt ourselves. This whole idea of meeting people where they are. Uh, there's something to that that's right, of course. But on the one hand, it seems like you leave everything of your behind, and you go over and listen to this person until you both drop dead, all right? And there's no <laughs> attempt, really, to say, OK, I've listened to you now. I've met you where you are. But there's problems here, all right? And it, we don't get to that point, all right? So, one of the books I first read was by Roberto de Matte called The Second Vatican Council. And it, it shows, we know that in any human endeavor, there's all sorts of things going on in the back rooms and deals being made and people being betrayed and all that sort of stuff. Well, that all happened at Vatican II. I'm not saying exceptionally so at Vatican II. Believe me, it happens in almost any human endeavor. But it seriously happened at the Second Vatican II. I mean, you know, that. When the Vatican Council opened, they had all these documents that had been approved by all the bishops of the world. They already had working documents. And within the first couple of weeks, those were all trashed. And they said, let's start all over again. And you want to say, what is that all about? How can you get the, a, a, an overwhelming consensus that these documents are good, and then all of a sudden you start all over again, right? Something happened there. Um, that De Matte has already al also written a book, a beautiful, fascinating book, Love for the Papacy and Filial Resistance to the Pope in the History of the Church. I mean, we have to, it, it's worth, it, the, the, the reading, he has a book about, um, I don't know if he has a book. I've just read two little books about Ath St. Athanasius, and a lot of you know a little bit about St. Athanasius. Um, he, he opposed all the bishops of the world who were, um, Arians, Arians, and they basically taught that Jesus was not equal to God, right? He was not, and Athanasius contra mundum, Athanasius stood up and said, you're wrong. And he was actually exiled uh, five times in his life, five times. He was a bishop, and he was exiled. And even though the, the Nicene Council supported him, the, the world just kept coming back to Arianism. And um, Athanasius kept getting chased. I mean, he had to hide from people sent by the Pope to capture him, right? He's Saint Athanasius, all right? He didn't stop. He said what had to be said, and they tried to get him rid of him. They couldn't get rid of him, all right? He kept coming up like that bad apple. Saint Pius the, the uh, uh, by, he's gotten to be one of my favorite saints, Saint Pius V. He inherited a, a, the church. Um, uh, after the at the Reformation, and he just did amazing things, uh, reforming uh, the church. Here we have some of you don't recognize him. He's Michael Davies. Michael Davies was a um, high school teacher, I think, in uh, England, and a Baptist, and fell in love with the Catholic Church. And right after Vatican II, started saying that lots of bad things were happening. This is you can find this online. This is. Um, He's the one on the right, and there's a, a diocesan priest. And this is a Bill Buckley show. If you t type in Bill Buckley and Michael Davies, Michael Davies flattens that priest. Um, and he's charming. He's very uh, knowledgeable. Uh, and it's just a wonderful view of a debate on, on Vatican II. He wrote a very large number of books. I, I have quite a few of them. I'm working my way through them. He's a beautiful writer. He documents everything he says. Again, in the 70s and 80s, when people would say Michael Davies, I'd say he's a nutcase, right? I wouldn't even think about him. I wouldn't really, I just put him over there. I dismissed him. And then all of a sudden I'm saying, wait a second, he deserves a hearing. I need to read what he says. And I have to say, I find him uh, more right than wrong. Sexual corruption. I've been dealing with that for a, a long time. Uh, one story is the modern seminaries. What is he laughing? He knows something. He knows something, all right? I taught at Sacred Heart Major Seminary in Detroit for 20 years, and it was, uh, 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 I was very privileged to serve the church um, in that way. Um, trying to form young men for the priesthood is, is a um, humbling uh, task. Young men who uh, want to give up the things of the world in order to serve to serve God. But there's something strange about seminaries, a lot. 
that's strange about semis. There has to be. It's a different kind of thing, all right? It's different from everything else, what, what's going on here. Um, but uh, the seminaries underwent enormous change with Vatican II, enormous change. I had a friend who was studying to be a Jesuit in the seven, 70s. He took very few philosophy and theology courses, took mostly courses on Marxism and um, sociology. And that was true across the board. Something like 20,000 priests left the priesthood, I think in the US, between 1970 and 1990. And I want to tell you, most of those were the heterosexuals. They left to get married. And they thought that eventually the church would allow marriage of pr priests and they could go back into the priesthood. Who was left behind? I'm not saying everybody was, believe me, I know some beautiful priests who have come out of that time, and I would not want in any way um, to disparage them, right? But it left behind a lot of homosexuals, all right? Why were homosexuals there in the first place? Well, you know, it's not a comfortable thing. It, what hasn't been in most cultures at most times to be a homosexual. And if you're gonna be a man that never gets married, and you don't want grandma asking you and everybody else, going, why, why didn't you get married? You know, go in the priesthood, all right? You're honored, you're respected, uh, you get to do beautiful things for people, all right? I'm not saying that all their, their motives were only to hide. I think they also wanted to serve, in a, many of them, in a beautiful way. But you put a bunch of men in an atmosphere like that, and um, unless they're healthy heterosexuals, you got trouble. A lot of trouble. And where did the bishops of the United States come from? And most places in the world, from very corrupt seminaries that were guided by homosexuals who were forming homosexuals to become um, priests and then bishops. And you had to go along to get along, right? Um, I've heard stories, you know, of men, young men who went into a seminary and they were sort of assigned some priests to have sexual intercourse with. One of the very first men I worked with told me he went to Sacred Heart in the 80s. And um, very soon he was abused by a priest. He went to tell another priest that he was abused by that priest. And he said that that priest abused him as well. He said then he was sent to um, North American College and he uh, just sighed a sigh of relief. He said that's it's gotta be a safe place. He said they only send the best there. He said within a couple weeks he stumbled upon an orgy a number of um, seminarians and priests were having an orgy in this big room. And he left the, he left the seminary, left the priesthood, and his life was devastated um, by that experience. He really didn't face it until about three or four years ago. He was leaving Michigan to move somewhere else, and he said as he left the state, it kind of hit him. Something happened to me there that I've been hiding from all this time. And it hit him like a, a ton of bricks. And he realized why he'd been angry his whole life, why he'd been defensive, why he'd been unable to have really satisfying, intimate relationships that this had, that this had happened to him. Right? And so I can't tell you how many of those stories I hear. So one of the problems of the church today is the kind of seminaries we had in the 70s, 60s, 70s, 80s, well into the 90s, and some places even still. There was a major cleanup of the seminaries after the Dallas Charter, right? The sex abuse crisis in the early part of this, end, this century. Um, I'm, I hope it was a substantial change. I mean, really down deep. I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced that there's still, it still isn't a problem, largely because the bishops we have today were formed in these very corrupt seminaries. A lot of them are homosexuals. I'll talk about this in a minute. Now, one person, oh dear, we, here I go again. One person who really fought this was Lefebvre. Lefebvre was, uh, that's, there's a, that's like about a 600 page book. One of the best things I've ever read, all right? Some of you are gonna say, oh well, again, there's, a, there's her tin hat. She's now become SSPX. She's gone off the deep end. I'm not SSPX, all right? But I think, Mar uh, uh, Mar Lefebvre was a much maligned man, and he really was a hero, right? Um, you read this book, he's not an intellectual, not that he isn't incredibly smart, but his skills were really, I have five minutes, sure. Um, 
don't, don't despair, don't despair. I'm not really, I'm not rejecting you, all right? Okay. Lefebvre, Lefebvre was a, an incredibly practical man. He could do almost anything. He could fix cars, he could build rooms, he could do anything. He was a missionary in Africa for, uh, I think, several decades. He built the church there like you can't believe, you know, traditional Latin mass, all right? Schools, religious orders, worked very hard on building a native um, priesthood in Africa, men that were Africans becoming the priests and bishops of Africa. Right. He came back and was a part of um, Vatican II. Right. At first he was enthusiastic all about it. But what he saw happen was all of this infiltration of the seminaries. And he even experienced in the early part of his seminary training. He shifted seminaries because he had modernists who were teaching him, like in the 1920s or so. So we think he saved the Latin Mass, which he did. But what he really did was he built a seminary. That was his purpose, was to uh, have a seminary that where men could be taught the truth of the faith. And at a certain point, uh, one of the twice now I've read of uh, bishops and cardinals sent from Rome to go investigate, do a visitation of the SSPX, uh, says it's exemplary. All seminaries should have the training that they have. All seminaries should be like the SSPX seminaries. They learn the faith, they learn the liturgy, they, they're manly, they're disciplined, um, and they're absolutely devoted um, uh, to the truth and saving souls, right? But as I've been talking about, a lavender mafia came into the church, and it came into the church largely because of the seminaries. Well, how did the seminaries get to be so bad? Again, a lot of the ideas that came in, modernism, etc. cetera, uh, part of the story is taught by Richard Sype, Richard Seip was a Benedictine priest, and he left the priesthood after a while. But he, he was very disturbed by the amount of homosexuality in his uh, order and in the priesthood in general. And he spent his life studying it. He wasn't necessarily opposed so much to homosexuality, but the coercion and the sort of the um, immaturity of the, the men. Um, and at one point in the early parts of uh, this century, he published something that's still online where he said 30% of the US bishops he could verify were active homosexuals, all right? I'm pretty sure it's a whole lot more now, all right? Because again, they went through the seminary at the corrupt times. As a matter of fact, an amazing book written by a priest, uh, Father Daniel Cousins, and I think it was 2001 or something, The Changing Face of the Priesthood. In 2001, he said, we have to admit it, we have a homosexual priesthood. That's what we have. So why aren't we learning how to form and live with and utilize the gifts of homosexual priests? He wasn't against it. He wasn't, he wasn't saying we need to keep homosexuals out of the priesthood. He was saying, let's face the fact, we have a homosexual priesthood. It's an amazing book to publish, right? This guy was a rector of a seminary and he was the vicar of priest for, I think it was the diocese of maybe Cleveland, somewhere in uh, Ohio. Okay, appointment of bishops. This is an amazing story. Give me five more minutes. All right, there's three books. Three books you gotta read. You'll enjoy all of them and more. These are all written by the same man, a, a priest named Father Charles Murr, M-U-R-R. -R. Terry Barber has done some great interviews of uh, Charles Murr. Uh, the first, one of the men that there's the godmother. The godmother was Pas Sister Pascalina, who was the right-hand lady, lady of um, Pope Pius XII. Uh, for 40 years, she was his assistant, all right? And Charles Murr was a, a young seminarian in Rome in the 1970s, and Pius had died, and Pascalina was there, and Pascalina told him all about what the church was like in the 50s and the 60s, etc. Quite the story, all right? Well, this is the amazing part of this story, is that um, at one point she told him how... Um, Let's see if I can get this right. Paul VI uh, asked, uh, um, was told by four top churchmen that the Vatican had been completely taken over by the Masons and a full investigation needed to be done. So Paul VI appointed uh, Bishop Gagnon, who eventually was Cardinal Gagnon of Canada, to do the investigation. He spent three years doing that investigation and Charles Murr 
was his chauffeur, his right-hand man, etc. Saw what was going on, learned what he was doing. He, they actually had his, he had his rooms, uh, Gagnon had his rooms uh, trashed, his papers thrown out, burned, etc. cetera. Uh, quite the story. They both had to go live in the Lebanese um, residence in Rome for priests. That story, it's a, it's a historical novel, the Syrian, fascinating reading uh, by, by um, Murr. Well, to make a fascinating story too short, um, what Gagnon found out was that the Vatican was peppered all over the place with Masons. And the most important one that he was concerned about was uh, Sebastian Baggio. Sebastian Baggio, B-A-G-G-I-O. Sebastian Baggio, um, oh my gosh, let me get the year. Something like um, oh, 73 to 85 or something was the head of the congregation that appointed bishops, and he was a mason, all right? So you had the cardinal of the world who was appointing cardinals of the world was a mason and choosing other men who were masons or at least who were sympathetic and would go along with the same ideas. So Cardinal Gagnon went to Paul VI and said, I, he had three volumes, different kinds of works, but big works about what he found. And Paul VI said, I'm very sick, I'm not gonna live long, I'll let my successor take care of this. And ah, yeah, that's how the work church works. Um, and um, Paul VI, but Gagnon said, please, 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 at least get rid of Baggio at least get rid of Baggio, he's the problem. He said, no, I'll let my successor. So the, his successors, you know, was John Paul I. And Gagnon went to John Paul I and said, you gotta get rid of Baggio. And uh, John Paul I said, I will. I am convinced, you're right, he's an evil man. And he called up Baggio and said, I want you to resign. He said, I'm not gonna resign. They were gonna give him Venice or something, they give him a nice seat, but nope, he wasn't gonna leave. He came over and had a shouting match, which was heard all over the Vatican rooms that are papal rooms. Ah, yeah, yeah, hello, hello. Okay, I'm, I'm getting there, getting there. Um, I know there's more important things for, than me here, which is the, the sacrament, we all wanna get there. Anyway, that night, John Paul I died, right, after his big fight with Baggio, and so Baggio was not removed. So when John Paul II came in, Gagnon went to John Paul II and said, you gotta get rid of Baggio. And he said, I'm not gonna do that. He said, I'm not gonna be a, pre, a, a pope that, you know, heads roll. I'm gonna teach around the world. And so Gagnon said, he said, you may not live that long. He said, you may not live that long. He said, I'm done. And he went back to Columbia where he had been a missionary. And um, John Paul II was, there was the assassination attempt on John Paul II. One of the first things he asked for when he came out of his stupor was get me Gagnon, all right? He got Gagnon in his office, talked to Gagnon, made him a cardinal, and fired Baggio, all right? Unbelievable, all right? So, yeah, it's an amazing, those books are just amazing to read. All right, so there, that's Baggio, that's um, Vilo, who was also high in the Vatican, he was also the nuncio of the United States. They appointed the bishops and the bishops we have appoint the next round of the bishops. And none of us know how he got in, all right? All right? Infiltration. They thought you were just a dumb Texan boy. That's what they thought, all right? You know that. And the other two bishops I know, same situation. There's, you look at them and they, they seem like they're mousy little guys, and they're not. They're brilliant and have backbones of steel, all right? but they don't look that way, so the hierarchy got um, deceived. All right, very quickly, modern post, Pope Paul VI, John, uh, Pope Paul VI, um, there he is with um, Bunini. I love Paul VI, Humanae Vitae, et cetera, but I'm very disappointed um, with his governance of the church. John Paul II, I couldn't, I didn't think I could love a, a pope more. Um, again, I love his, his writings, his legacy, but what he did at Assisi with many religions, that wasn't so smart. That doesn't mean he's an evil pope. I mean, people make mistakes, right? But it was a mistake, and it was probably a pretty big mistake, but I still love him. And I thought I could never love a pope as much as I loved John Paul II. And then Ratzinger stood on the, the, the balcony, and I said, oh, I love, I love Joseph Ratzinger. And I still do. Now, 
Joseph Ratzinger it was uh, unbelievable. I, I just read, a tw I just listened to a 24 hour audio book on his life. Extraordinary, extraordinary person. But when he was, he was like 35 and 38 when he was at Vatican II, when he was quite the influence on Vatican II. And he was happy enough with modernism. He didn't remain happy enough with, uh, with modernism, all right? But it's, it's a blemish, but maybe it's not a blemish. Maybe it's one of those beautiful blemishes that was there and he went in the right direction. And then of course now we have Pope Francis. And I, I typed in popularity of Pope Francis when I was looking for a picture of this when it came up. But all the articles are from like 2014 and 15. Now all the articles say his popularity is plummeting. Um, one of the folks, first books was The Dictator Pope by Richard Sire, very worth reading, all right? Some of us know about um, the St. Gallen Mafia, that there was actually a lobby of self-admitted, self-admitted, this is not uncovering something, uh, Cardinal Daniels said, well, you know, we got together and, and, and um, in uh, St. Gallen uh, to talk about who was gonna be the next Pope. Uh, and when they wanted Bergoglio when Ratzinger uh, won, and then they, they got him the second time. This is a book by one of my colleagues uh, at Echeverria, um, and he, he actually did a turnabout, it's an amazing thing. First, when Pope Francis came in and was saying all these ambiguous things, he tried to show how they could be reconciled with church teaching. And God bless him, a man of integrity, he wrote a second edition and he said they can't be, all right? So what do we do now? Here's our one slide. Are you ready? And we're gonna do it, right? <laughs> we're gonna do it, all right? The, the most important thing is for all of us to become deeper in our faith. I, when, uh, when my colleagues at the seminary and I, when the McCarrick thing came up, we were all devastated. Now we all, you know, academics are not like humble people. You know, we're pretty full of ourselves. And among many things, you know, we think, oh man, we're, we're, we're high class Catholics. I mean, we're, we're probably better than, you know, 90% of other Catholics, easily, easily, you know. Um, and then we sort of look at this and we look at our lives and we look at what's going on and say, oh my gosh, we're probably 60% and we're not doing the praying that we should be doing and the sacrificing and the, and the fasting, et cetera. And every one of us made resolutions to dig deeper. On, and this is where we can see the work of the Holy Spirit in all of this. Um, we all know we can, we should, we absolutely need to be better Catholics. We need to spend more time in prayer. Uh, not that we don't need to know all this stuff, it's good to know. When people say bad things about the church, we can agree with them. Um, but we can explain it to some extent. And we can explain that the church has been, at least it's been in bad places before. And it's not a church of human beings. It's a church of the Holy Spirit. And so that's what it still is, and that's what it will always be. Thank you.